November 28th, uh, will come to order. Please rise and follow and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll move into oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the City Council on any item on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comment will not be taken during each individual agenda item, except for public hearing items. Comments on public hearing items will be heard when that item is scheduled for discussion. On any item not appearing on this posted agenda, however, your concerns may be referred to a staff or set for a discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to speaking once for up to three minutes. First speaker is Raymond Foster. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, city staff, and members of the community. Hey, so tomorrow at uh, 11.30 a.m., the Chamber of Commerce is having their uh, monthly network networking luncheon, uh, and the speaker will be on the networking triad, reciprocity, value, and storytelling. That will be at West Park Senior Center, Living Center at 801 Cypress here in San Dimas. That's 11.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, to starting on Friday, two of our eighth graders from Lone Hill Middle School will be at the Teen Leadership Camp in Camp Cedar Crest in Running Springs. Um, this is a annual rotary program. We've been doing it for at least three decades. And these students will interact with um, participants with activities from over 200 of their peers throughout the San Gabriel Valley and all the way up to Southern Nevada. So it's a pretty cool three-day program for them. We're excited they'll be there. This Saturday is the holiday extravaganza and the staff has done a great job in planning this gig. But I want you to know that like the last three or four years, Rotary will be handing out free coffee, other side of Ace Hardware. So just stop by and get a cup of coffee, especially sometimes it gets cold in late November and coffee's good. On the 13th, um, Rotary has two meetings, as you know, on Wednesdays. The noon Rotary will have Daniel Bringhurst. His um, topic is unlocking your business's full potential with the cycle of success. And at six o'clock, these are all by a Zoom, by the way, will be Charles Navarro. He's an employment resource coordinator for the DOD, Department of Defense. And he will be talking about soldier transition from, uh, from the military to the uh, civilian workforce. January 18th, Chamber of Commerce After Hours Mixer will be sponsored by the 2026 committee. That is the committee planning the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence here in the city of San Dimas. Finally, on March 9th, will be our Feeding Heroes food drive. You know, this we've done 13 tons worth of food. Uh, and not only will we be doing 29 palms, the Pelican Pantry, but we're now including the P Pendleton Pantry. We're gonna try to get seven tons so we can take six out to uh, 29 palms and a ton down to Pendleton. But uh, the exciting thing is we've received our first donation for the drive in March, and it's from Tampa, Florida. A veteran in Tampa, Florida has heard about the food drives and sent me a check to the Rotary Foundation here in San Dimas for 50 bucks. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that's all the way on the other coast. That's how um, people are beginning to learn about what we're doing here. So uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions, 909-599-7530 or sandemusrotary at gmail.com. That's sandemusrotary at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me, Deborah, before you call the next person. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, I just wanted to make a note that the uh, city manager is under the weather at this time, but he is with us on Zoom, and uh, so he's going to hear everything that's said, and I'm quite sure he'll report back uh, anything that he feels needs to be uh, covered. But tonight we're going to have Brad McKinney, our assistant city manager, who's going to be in his, in his stead, who's more than capable of taking care of this meeting. So, Brad, thank you very much. Madam Clerk, would you please continue? Next speaker is Pamela Stevens. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Councilmen. 
the state attorney and the acting <laughs> city manager. We are the residents. By the way, my name's Pam Stevens. This is my neighbor and friend, LaVita Casper. We live on Windsor Drive. At 1438, uh, we have a squatter. They moved into a um, for sale home that was empty, broke into the locks, moved in, changed the locks, and are now inhabiting the property. And there's a lot of other residents from Windsor Drive here tonight, and we're all very upset about it. We, we don't understand why the sheriffs let them stay, because they came out and uh, were shown some bogus um, lease agreement. Um, yes, I live directly next door to them, and it's a concern for me. Um, I have two young daughters. I just retired from the police department myself, my husband as well. And I don't even feel safe in my neighborhood. This is a time where I want to relax. All the neighbors want to relax, but we can't. They moved in. The real, real estate agent was notified that Sunday. The police responded. Um, and basically, they pulled them out of the house, and nothing happened. I don't understand how you can, how the police can look at a fraudulent Re, um, rental agreement, and you have the real estate agent right there telling them he didn't give them permission, and the owners are in China, and he's been handling all the business. I don't understand how they were allowed to stay there. I, it, it just blows my mind how they were allowed to stay there. Um, the neighbors don't feel safe on the street. Everyone is making sure they have cameras now. Um, Basically, um, we just want extra patrol because most of their activity is not during the day. It's quiet during the day. At night, um, let me go my time. At night, that's when they have activity going. They're not, people are not coming. There's not foot traffic, but they're driving their cars up and down the street all night. Neighbors are seeing this. I'm seeing this. We just want to know what we can do. And I understand the city's not responsible. Um, the owner is. But we just, as residents, we pay our mortgage, we pay our property tax. We need to know what's going on, what we can do to protect ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Deborah? I think. Deborah? Uh, Deborah? Hang on just a minute. I know there's a lot of people in the audience who have a lot they would like to say. And, and I certainly appreciate that because we want to hear it. But I want to, if I could beg your forgiveness for just a moment, okay? We have Senator, or Senator Susan Rubio who just entered the room who had asked to speak first because she needs to go to another engagement. Uh, if you guys, unless you stand up and yell no, 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 if you don't mind, I'd like her to have the opportunity to speak and then she'll leave, and then we'll be able to speak with you guys for the balance of the evening. Okay? Is that anybody really upset with that? Because please tell me, because you guys, she's important, but you're more important at this point in time. So are you guys okay with that? Thank you. Senator Rubio? Good evening, Mayor, Good evening, Mayor and, and Council, council members. And, members, and of course, you, yeah, are, of important course you are important to me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, is there an echo? Okay. Shall we try it? Okay, so thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to interject in your, your commentary, but um, thank you, Mayor. I wanted just to really quickly introduce myself. I know that I've been here for a little while, but I wanted to um, at least share with your community and all of you uh, why you haven't seen me for the last five years. I'm State Senator Susan Rubio, representing the 22nd Senate District for, for five years now, but just acquired this beautiful city since January of this year through redistricting. So, and um, by law, we have to be in Sacramento Monday through Thursday 
And so we don't have the privilege of coming often. And when I, I get to, to spend time here, especially because of the holidays, I want to come and make sure that everyone knows what we're doing in Sacramento. It feels like such a mystery, but I wanted to make sure you know that we're working hard on your behalf. And I uh, have the privilege at least understanding some of the, the funding that comes your way and what happens to it. So I wanted to highlight some of the funding that we've uh, delivered, uh, in particular myself, since I got elected in 2018. I've been able to bring $130 million uh, specifically to the cities of the Sangro Valley. And again, I just acquired a few cities in the Inland Empire, and I've been able to deliver in the last, uh, what is it, 11 months now. So I wanted to share uh, what I did. Uh, the first year I got elected, I was able to create the Regional Housing Trust for the Sangro Valley. Council of Governments, and I put in $36 million that I uh, uh, took directly um, from the state budget to um, make sure that we supported our local cities when it came to housing. I served on a local community. I was a council member for 13 years, and one of my biggest frustrations was that, you know, as I heard over here back behind me, you know, we always have safety concerns, house, housing issues, uh, mental health issues, and and I know that it's really hard to depend on others to bring funding, so I want it to be that support system. So with the $36 million that I brought, we've already been able to um, deliver, um, not deliver, but it's in progress, 750 affordable housing units uh, in cities across the region. By way of example, Pomona is building two projects. They got $4 million, two for one project, two for the other project. And this is free money. Uh, only requirement is that they have a shovel-ready project and that they're able to help their community. Um, Alhambra took advantage of it. I believe they got $2 million. Anyways, on and on, we've been giving quite a bit of money to, to cities that are ready to, to build housing. I also brought $25 million to build a community center for the city of Alhambra. I brought $10 million to support teachers. I'm I've been a teacher for nearly 20 years, and I know how difficult it is um, you know, to get support, and so that went specifically for teacher development and support and materials. I was able to bring $5 million uh, in workforce development. I was able to split it up. I gave SCAG, which is the Southern California Council of Governments, $4 million. And what they've been doing, they've been creating a program that's really going to help with economic development to make sure that uh, we look at it subgroups, for example, women, minority women, veterans, um, you know, those that are experiencing homelessness, how do we bring everyone together and figure out how do we find a path to ensure that everyone has a job after the recovery. Uh, I was able to give $1 million to the Council of Government, which is specific to our, to our region, um, SJV COG, and they created a program uh, in collaboration with God's Pantry. Uh, with that million dollars, they're taking um, those foster youths that are transitioning out that end up homeless and giving them you know, skills. Uh, the beauty of this is not just a workforce development program, it actually pays a salary while they're working and training. So we graduated the second class last week, I believe it was. About 20 people already have been you know, taken advantage of that. And when they um, graduate, they have a job ready waiting for them. And um, I'm building two parks. I was able to give $6 million to Ballin Park uh, for a community park. The other six went to La Puente. They're also uh, taking advantage of some of that funding. Um, these are 15 bills that I passed this year. It's too much to go over it, but I was so proud um, of just uh, having 100%. I was lucky this year. I didn't get any vetoes. But... Um, I wanted to show SP20, which is the very first one that you see, Regional Housing Trust, um, because we've been so successful with building housing and how fast we're doing it and how much we're helping our local cities uh, give them money so that to support their, their projects. Um, everyone started copying the model that Sangro Valley started doing. In fact, we were advising Los Angeles County because they just uh, created their housing trust and that was modeled after ours. Uh, Pasadena has one now. Uh, Glendora. So what I decided to do is to pass a bill that was going to allow everyone across the state to, to do the, what we're doing. In fact, we have visitors from all the way from Texas visiting some of the projects, which is incredible to see, to be the model, not only for our state, but for, for the nation. And there's a lot of bills here, but I, as I go through the presentation, I want to sh I share some of them. Um, I was able to bring this year $1.5 million to local law enforcement, so that goes directly to the cities. There were seven cities that were um, 
that had the benefit of this funding, all of them got from 200 to 300,000. And um, Mayor, just so you know, and council members, um, you're, you haven't received it yet, but you will be getting uh, 200,000 directly for your police department for whatever they need, either radio upgrades, technology. And, uh, and I know that I'm, most of you know that I'm a strong supporter of public safety. Uh, most of my policies are directed to making sure that our families are safe from violence, a lot of domestic violence. I work with a lot of mothers of murdered children, so public safety is my top priority. So um, at least seven of my cities were able to benefit, and your funding will be coming soon. So when it does, uh, you know, I'll circle back, and hopefully you guys can put it to good use. Um, I was able to give uh, Ontario, well, let me back up. It's 8.5 million to establish the College of Health and Community Wellbeing in Ontario, but it's actually an extension of the University of Laverne. So I'm collaborating with Laverne so they could open a college in that region because we normally don't have students from those disadvantaged areas that have access to higher education. So hopefully this will not only create good paying jobs as we're building the college, but also uh, build the pipeline for the next uh, healthcare workers, uh, mental health professionals, and the beauty is that do, they did commit to paying at least 70% of the tuition for students, so they leave with a career and, and debt-free, which I think it's important to all of us. And I also was able to give this year $2.5 million to ELAC. I graduated from ELAC, and I, uh, I do represent Monterey Park. It's one of my cities. So um, what I heard after the pandemic was so many businesses were closing their doors and they really didn't have a way out. Um, that's one bucket. The other bucket is so many of our students who don't want to spend four years in a four-year uh, community college trying to earn a degree to figure out what to do. I mean, these are really, um, you know, just smart, innovative students that want to start jobs and, I'm sorry, to start um, businesses. So we created the, well, we're going to build the Business Entrepreneurship Center at East Los Angeles Community College where uh, they're going to pay the overhead. Uh, they have advisors that are going to advise them on finances, a uh, job plan, anything that they need. So um, it's paid for. It's there. They can access that. And so hopefully those that lost their businesses during the pandemic can take advantage of this. And students that don't necessarily want to go to a four-year college can take advantage of this. So these are some of the bills that I've done on, you know, keeping children safe, uh, domestic violence, uh, and families that are experiencing a loss of a loved one. I'm only going to point out a few. Um, this year, I passed SB 14, which uh, I was trying to pass for three years. That's why I'm so proud this year that the governor finally signed it. In California, uh, sex trafficking a minor was not a serious felony. A serious felony, and so I wanted to make sure that we hold perpetrators accountable when they're selling our children for sex. I think we all want that. So now this bill were, is going to ensure that, uh, you know, that they're held accountable and that the law really, you know, um, focuses on, on the harm that they're doing to our children, and if they're repeat offenders, you know, it gets worse. So um, I'm happy that that one passed. I also uh, pass, um, let me see here, SB 331, if you look at uh, the picture on the right, that's Anna Steves, uh, that is Peaky's mom. It was named after a five-year little boy who was lost at the hands of his father. Uh, they were getting a divorce and he felt that that was the only way that he can, um, you know, get back at her. And so Peaky's law will now reform family court and it's going to mandate that there's education in particular in domestic violence cases, particular custody cases, so they can re judge us respectfully. I know that they set out to do the right thing, but sometimes the information is lacking, and this is going to help to improve the system to make sure that we don't have any other tragedies, at least like this, that could have been prevented. Um, I passed SB 1141, which is coercive control. Uh, typically, we recognize domestic violence as a physical assault, assault. So if you go to court, you have to show bruises and broken bones now, and I wanna make sure everyone's listening to this, if you have a family friend or um, a neighbor, uh, now it is considered domestic violence if someone is psychologically um, damaging you. Sometimes it's by way of taking basic necessities. Um, I know cases where they're not allowed to eat or sleep uh, for days, or they won't allow them to see their families, go to school, and all this is an attempt to entrap a person, and after a while, it becomes psychologically damaging, and some victims are experiencing 
uh, PTSD for up to 8 to 10 to 20 years. And so now they can use course of control as, as supporting evidence in court. Anyways, I could go on and on. As you can tell, I'm very proud of the work I do in this regard. And at the last one, it says be thir uh, 316. As a teacher, it was important for me that every child in every household had access to the uh, National Domestic Violence Hotline. If anybody has a child from seventh grade to higher education, the number is now mandated to be printed on the back of the ID cards. Um, we're doing a lot of investment on mental health, and I know I'm already taking a lot of your time, so I'm just gonna pass through some of this. Um, I don't think I wanna break it down because you have been at the forefront of joining me with all the funding that comes for transit and the foot uh, hill goal line, and so there's a lot of, of Great projects happening. Um, I just want to highlight that I am right now the current chair of the Sanger Valley Caucus, and that means that my job is to bring all the senators and assembly members together so that we can fight for projects and funding that help the region, not just my, my district. And I've been focusing on a lot of uh, climate change issues, so I delivered $12 million to the Mountain Sanger Valley Mountain Conservancy for uh, climate change resiliency, water treatment projects, water conservation projects. And so I'll continue to focus on some of these issues that are pressing. That's why we end up with a lot of fires. Um, that funding also went to uh, give grants to the families that have houses up in the foothills to retrofit their homes to make sure they're fire resilient and that they have defensible space and that um, uh, at least if there's fires, they have a chance of being successful in saving their homes. And I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry it's long, but this is my first time coming and there's so much to, to, to deliver and share. And I just want to give you a snippet. There's so much more. If you have any questions, anybody want to come up and ask me about anything else, I'm always accessible and available. But uh, we have a lot of good things happening. I'll continue to give you legislative updates as they come. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you. Council, for your time. Are there any questions time. for the center? Thank you for uh, coming, Senator, and uh, appreciate the hard work you do. I, I don't know how you can, you, I, I've seen you many times and you have so much energy, <laughs> I don't know when you sleep, but uh, you are delivering a lot for, the, for your district and, and the region. Thank, thank you. I, I also want to thank you very much for, for coming. I know that we've had conversation back and forth. Uh, I think it's extremely good news that that $200,000 is coming. We know you, you're an honest person. I know the check's in the mail. So thank you very much. And, and uh, once again, you're welcome anytime. I'm you know, sorry that uh, we don't have more time tonight to talk, but the reality is that we have some people that have a, a great concern. So. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, I want to also express my gratitude and thank you for not just your legislative record, which is going to make a huge difference in the lives of victims, but also the effort that you put forward to secure funds and ensure that you're investing in the region. So thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership. We're really lucky to have you as our senator representing this, uh, this part of town, this part of the county. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you, and I just want to apologize once again. My intention was not to cut testimonials, so thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, can we continue with the uh, oral communications, please? The uh, last speaker card was Levita Casper. I'm not sure if that's... Okay, that's what I thought so, but... Okay. was the last speaker card, Mayor. All right. At this time, anyone wishing who did not fill out a speaker card, but anyone wishing to, to address the council, feel free to come up one at a time. You know, state your reason why you're here. You'll have three minutes, just like if you had to turn in a card. So at this time, anyone wishing to speak, please come up to the podium. Good evening, council members. Thank you for allowing me in a few minutes to speak. My name is Michael Moore. I'm a resident on Windsor Drive along with my neighbors back here. And as LaVita and uh, Patricia talked earlier, we've got a squatter in our neighborhood, which is very disturbing to me who has lived in the house that I've been in for 35 years. Uh, I've always felt San Dimas was a very safe community. 
and to have this type of activity going on on our streets is very troubling. Uh, doubly troubling is the fact that um, the Sheriff's Department was called out the day when this occurred and there obviously was probable cause to investigate. Uh, these people broke into this house and changed the locks. I feel like there should have been an arrest made for breaking and entering, not allowing the people to remain in the house and have to go through this crazy civil process to remove a squatter from a location. Uh, we've all seen lots of news articles about people showing up and you know the bad news is this is an absentee owner, the guy's in China right now. My guess is is that before that person, these people are you know pushed out of this property, there's gonna be a lot of damage done. We just don't need that. Um, I think that you know you guys as the council have to impress upon the sheriff's department, a member of whom is sitting back here right now, uh, we've had numerous members from the sheriff's office showing up on a fairly consistent basis because my neighborhood is full of either current or former law enforcement officers. Both sides of this house, there's an Irvine police officer on one side, there's two retired LAPD on the other side, there's a captain of the sheriff's department that just retired across the street from them. Nobody's happy about this situation. So, you know, we really would ask that you guys would get something done to help us with this situation. And, you know, I realize you're limited by the, the constraints involved in the law, but it just doesn't seem right to me that squatters should have more rights than the residents in a neighborhood that, you know, pay the taxes and essentially pay the salaries of public servants. Not you guys, obviously, because this isn't a paid position, but I understand that. So thank you for letting me say my piece. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council at this time? Seeing none, I'll ask the city attorney, is there something that we could need to say at this point or how, how do we, how are we going to address <clears throat> this to make sure communications is? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is not on the agenda tonight, so we cannot get into a big discussion, but I would say uh, that if the public comments being made tonight are accurate, that this is a very unfortunate situation. Um, there would be a crime taking place, a, a trespass crime in the city, if these allegations are true. Um, the city does not get involved with that other than um, through the Sheriff's Department. If the Sheriff's Department finds that there is not sufficient evidence to take anyone into custody or to prevent the crime from happening, then that's the call um, that they have to make for every day for any crime that they get called out on. Um, and if that's the case, then it is the property owner. It, it's a private civil dispute between a, a property owner and a person who should not be on their property. The property owner can go to court, have that person evicted. Um, and that's, that seems to be where it stands right now. All right. Captain Mash, would you like to speak? Good evening. So uh, we're very concerned also. Unfortunately, when the deputies did arrive at the location when the call for service was made, uh, the lady that was uh, <clears throat> at the location was asked to come out and they came outside. After investigating for a little while, they presented Obviously, some people think it, uh, believe it's a uh, fraudulent uh, lease agreement. So they produced a fraudulent lease agreement. They had the keys to the house. They had a bill of deposit that was given to a person for $3,800. So at that point, our policies and procedures, like our city attorney has indicated, we have to back off and ensure that the owner has to take some steps to rectify the matter. So now it becomes a, uh, even though a lot of us believe that uh, she might be, or the person living there might be a, a person who's not supposed to be there and is a squatter, that has to go through the civil process. And today I spoke to the actual realtor, Mr. Jeffrey Chow. I spoke to him at length. And um, he's representing the owner, Jackie Chan. Uh, who lives in uh, China, and they have uh, hired an attorney today, and they're going through the civil process to get the person evicted. In the civil process, they have to get served with, uh, with a, with a um, 
notice to vacate, and then if they don't notice, to, if they don't vacate within three days, they have to file an unlawful detainer. They get a court date, and then hopefully they'll appear at the court date. If they don't, I think they automatically lose a court case, and then our civil management bureau will come out and uh, evict them from the property. However, it's an unfortunate incident. Um, this type of crime used to occur all the time back when we had the mortgage uh, meltdown. There was uh, squatters all over. So uh, now it's happening again, obviously, right? But we don't know that this person is a squatter because she's producing documents that the deputy at, at face value cannot determine if it's valid or not. So it has to go through the court process. It's once we determine that that is either legal or illegal, the judge will give a notice of action and then we could, along with the uh, Civil Management Bureau, get these folks out of the location. Thank and you. I'll work with our uh, residents here, obviously. I'm very sorry that you guys are going through this process. Trust me, when deputies go to a location, what they want to do is they want to fix the situation right away because they want to make sure that you guys don't suffer in any way. So with that being said, we're very sorry that we couldn't fix the situation at the time and we're doing everything we can to help the owners and the actual property realtor to you know, uh, help, help them along the process and hopefully get these people out of there if they are squatters, right? Obviously, they, you know, they produce documents that uh, the deputy that's out there doesn't know if it's legal, it's not legal, it becomes a legal matter, right? And uh, we have to make sure that we operate within the law that's established for us, obviously. Um, it's easy to get somebody out of the house using either getting compliance or using physical force, obviously. If we have legal standing, we could do that. But if we don't have legal standing, it's really hard to uh, get somebody out without a court order. So that's, that's the way we are trying to uh, resolve the situation for everybody. But we'll make sure that we provide additional uh, patrol requests on Windsor. So you guys could be, uh, definitely. And uh, I could meet with anybody outside to talk about anything else that you guys have. And you guys want to talk about, okay? Excuse me, sir. Okay. I apologize, but under this oral communications, we can't have asking these type of questions, but maybe the captain will, could answer those questions outside. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Captain. So just to let you guys know, I personally went out there today myself. I looked at the property um, and um, talked to some of the neighbors. Obviously, we're taking this matter seriously, you know, and... Uh, We'll resolve it. Uh, it might take a couple more weeks than <laughs> usual, but we're going to resolve it one way or another. So, and I also noticed that there's another home for sale in the street also. So, so uh, it's good to have active neighbors and active residents uh, such as they're behind me because that's how we're going to keep our community safe. So thank you very much for bringing this matter forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I might note that as, as read in the beginning, the Brown Act, you know, we, this portion of the uh, council meeting is governed by the Brown Act. Uh, I do have council members who have some questions themselves, but we're not allowed to you know, speak, speak to them at this point. But each councilman will contact whoever they need to contact and go from there. All right, thank you very much. And I apologize and I thank you for being understanding when Senator Rubio came. Do we have any additional speakers? Thank you. We'll move into the consent calendar. All items of the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion unless a member of the city council requests a separate discussion. I move approval. Second. Any additional questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. That'll be the end of the consent calendar. We'll move off into the public hearing. Uh, Ken Fisselman. That's you. Fisselman. Somethingman. <laughs> Vickleman.
Ken? Consideration of the Public Text Code Text Amendment 22-0003 to amend Chapter 1842, Multiple Family MF Zone to reduce the required amount of open green space, open space, and the required front and side yard setbacks for development in the, in the MF zone. And chapters 18.156, vehicle parking and storage with respect to the vehicle parking requirements for multifamily developments along with associated cleanup items. And determination of exemption from the CEQA under CEQA guidelines 15061B3. Ken. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council Members. Uh, so we are here again about the MCTA that the Mayor just so eloquently described. A um, little background to refresh everybody. Uh, this is what began in 2022, about mid-year. Staff received an application for a Municipal Code Tax Amendment to amend Chapter 1842 of the San Diego Municipal Code. That amendment was initiated by the Planning Commission on May 19th, 2022. On September 27th, 2022, the City Council approved the six cycle housing element, uh, which was further certified by HCD on October 14th, 2022. Within the housing element were programs that said that the open space requirements, setbacks, and parking requirements were identified as potential impediments to development. And programs 10 and 11 of the housing element called for the city to amend setback open space requirements and parking requirements to alleviate these constraints on development in the MF zone. On September 26, 2023, the city council held a study session to discuss the proposed standards and provide feedback. Um, all numbers and setbacks, which you will see in this presentation were gained from that study session. On November 2nd, 2023, the Planning Commission held a public hearing and did vote 5-0 to recommend approval of the MCTA to the City Council. Uh, for open space requirements, the San Dimas Municipal Code currently calls for 30% of a parcel to be maintained as usable open space. Uh, the open space may not include the front setback, which is 25 feet currently, and may only include the rear side setbacks with a conditional use permit. Staff surveyed nearby and similar cities to understand their open space requirements, which can be seen in the table below. Of note is that San Dimas is among the highest as far as the uh, amount of open space required for any new development. Um, and although we do not require a private space requirement, it's still, the open space requirement still equals or exceeds that of every other nearby city with the exception of Laverne and Claremont. Uh, staff is therefore proposing a 400 square foot per unit open space requirement. Um, with that, at least 50% of any provided open space requirement must be contiguous. And recreational structures may occupy or be counted towards required open space, uh, but only 50% of lots up to 15,000 square feet and only 25% for lots over 15,000 square feet. This ensures that actual open space on the lot is provided and that a rec room or gym within a Development is not counting for all the open space. Uh, for setbacks, staff again surveyed the nearby and similar cities for setback requirements. And again, San Dimas was among the highest when it came to front and interior side setbacks. Uh, staff is proposing changing the front setback to 20 feet, side setback when adjacent to single family zone lots to 15 feet for the first floor and 20 feet for the second or third floor. This ensures that any single family home would be at least 20 feet and possibly up to 30 or 27 feet from the adjacent multifamily building on the first floor. Uh, the side setback when not adjacent to single family zone lots at 15 feet. Street side setbacks matching that at 15 feet. And we're eliminating language that requires three-story buildings to have a front setback equal to their height, because that could very easily equal front setbacks of up to 35 feet. Uh, this following chart breaks down the current and proposed open space and setback requirements. So again, open space goes from 30% of the total lot to 400 square feet per unit. Front setback is currently an average of 25 feet, not less than, 20, not less than 15 feet. Uh, we're proposing just a straight 20 feet. 
Uh, rear, we are not changing the standard. It would remain at 20 feet. Uh, side single family adjacent is currently 20 feet for the first story and 30 feet for second and third. We are proposing reducing that to 15 feet for the first story and 20 feet for the second and third story. Uh, side setback when adjacent to any other type of property would be 15 feet rather than the current 20. And street side setback would go from 25 feet to 15 feet. Uh, for parking, the San Dimas Municipal Code currently calls for two covered spaces per unit plus one non-covered space for each additional bedroom beyond two bedrooms per unit, which would be three parking spaces for a three bedroom, four for a four bedroom, so on. It also requires one non-covered guest space for every three units. Uh, the following chart shows that staff did survey nearby or similar cities for their parking requirements. Um, again, we were among the highest, not the highest, uh, but we were one of the few that required multiple or more parking spaces for anything above a two bedroom unit. Staff is currently proposing 1.5 covered spaces per studio or one bedroom. That doesn't mean they need to require or you know, you're not actually providing 1.5 spots for every unit, it's just an average of all the units. And two covered spaces for units with two or more bedrooms, plus one non-covered guest space for every four units. Uh, staff leaves these standards still provide for an adequate number of parking spaces while allowing that every unit rented may not require two full parking spaces. Um, it is important to note at this point that AB 2097 does prohibit a city from imposing minimum parking standards within a half mile of a major transit stop, which the upcoming Gold Line Station will be. And also that the proposed changes will not affect any of the properties located within the downtown specific plan area. These are all outside of what that plan will cover. With that, uh, staff and the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council open the public hearing, take public testimony and close the public hearing and it, the City Council introduces Ordinance 1301, approving Municipal Code Text Amendment 22-0003, amending Chapter 18.42, Multiple Family Zone, um, to reduce the required amount of open green areas, open space, and the required front and side yard setbacks for developments within the multifamily zone and chapter 18.156, vehicle parking and storage with respect to vehicle parking requirements for multifamily developments along with associated cleanup items and determine that the ordinance is exempt from CEQA under CEQA guidelines, section 15061B3. Um, with that, that is all staff has. And we are here to answer any questions that the council may have. We'll come back to questions after we open the public hearing. Public hearing is open. Anyone wishing to speak to either for this matter or against this matter, uh, please come up to the podium. And Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Questions from the City Council? I had a question. I had some questions. Um, so, and I uh, emailed Ken uh, a number of these earlier. There might have been one or two that uh, came to mind later on, but um, this, so this um, municipal code text amendment was requested by a property owner, and so we're, we're proceeding uh, on amending the, the mul multiple family zone, and it dovetails, as Ken was saying, into state requirements and our housing element to do something about the, the multiple family zone to make it easier um, to have a little bit more density on the uh, now um, I'll have some comments after after the questions, but or after everybody asks questions, but So regarding the one property which is a good example of what could happen and that was at 912 North San Dimas Avenue as you might recall Couple of questions um, on that property would three stories be allowed would they be allowed? Yes. Would they be feasible? No, uh, because it wouldn't increase the number of units they could do. Um, we're not increasing density with this amendment. We're just increasing what they, we're making it easier for them to build what they should be able to build by density standards. Mm -hmm. um, 
so they wouldn't get really extra units by going to three stories. And, and you're saying it wouldn't be economically feasible, but it would be possible if somebody wanted to go to three units. Correct, three, but three stories. You're, you're getting out the economic feasibility range at that point. Okay. Um, so, so you and then you answered the question I had here that it would allow four units on that particular lot. Okay. Second question um, had to do with um, a maximum co ground coverage of buildings. Okay, and if anybody wants to take a look at this, it's on. It's under the uh, ordinance and has, you know, it doesn't really have a change to it, but it, I, uh, there's a question I have the page, on page, uh, page 123 of the agenda packet, page six of the uh, municipal code of, of uh, catchment A, I think it is, text, you know. but um, it's under property development standards and it has in 18.42.050, uh, paragraph B, it talks about 60% of the total lot or parcel area can be covered by residential structures, parking facilities, paved areas like driveways and, and parking spots that are not covered. And I was just wondering if trash enclosures are included in that, those, those buildings and lot coverage that um, would make up the 60%. We would include, at the end of that section you cite, it says ex facilities are exempt, and we would consider trash facilities as exempt under that. Okay, so trash facilities are exempt. Could we, if we wanted to, add them and make trash facilities part of the 60%? Uh, we could. I mean, at that point, you're talking about maybe 20, 30 square feet, so we're not talking about any kind of number that would you know, move the needle, but we could make them count towards lot coverage. Okay, I understand. All right. Um, I was noticing that Laverne was added to the chart, the various charts, and it looks like they're pretty generous with their open space requirement for open space um, at 45%. So that's pretty high, a lot higher than San Dimas, of course. Ken, you were saying that they are probably, or do you have any news or information on them proceeding with any changes to, to modify that? Well, Laverne is important to note for two, for two reasons. The first is that they do allow the front setback to be counted as open space, and that can count as a significant percentage of the lot. Uh, the second is, much as like the process we are going through now, Laverne has been tasked in their housing element with identifying uh, constraints to development and working to resolve those through future code text amendments. So while they are at 45% now, it is reasonable to believe that they will need to change that in the next year or so as they move through their housing element programs. Okay. Um, I noticed that in the, in the text of, the, uh, of the, the code, open green areas was changed to open space areas. Could you elaborate on what that, the reason for that is? It's just semantics at this point. We have referred to it at different places in the entire San Dimas Municipal Code text amendment as different things. We felt that open space was a better description of what we were actually trying to go for. Open green areas would include just large unusable areas, which may be scenic setbacks or you know, portions of a lot which couldn't be developed. Um, that it wasn't the purpose of this. The purpose is to create open space for the residents of those units to enjoy. And might it be a good idea, does it, I, I can't remember, does it say usable open space? I'm trying to. It, trying to. it does in parts of it. So we are, when we do any kind of site plan review for this, uh, they won't just be able to call something open space. We would ensure through the review process that it is usable open space that the residents can actually enjoy. Okay, and I remember we talked about uh, certain things being allowed in open space that may not be allowed now, like pools and um, courts and other things. Um, was a rec building part of uh, something that's allowed in the open space area? So it wasn't that those items weren't allowed, it's that those were counted minusculely towards the requirements. I think it was 6% that they could be count towards. So what we're proposing is that they actually be al allowed to count for a larger percentage of the open space because they are usable open space elements for the residents. Um, we also are proposing that something like a rec room could count as a percentage of that total because that is, again, that's 
usable space for the residents to enjoy, which may actually provide a greater benefit than having a few hundred square feet of lawn in the back of the property. So that's a common area, the, the, a, a rec building, but it's not open space. Correct. But you're, but you're, in the definition, you're saying that it is open space or it could be part of open space or use the open space, whatever. We're just, we're, we would allow it to count as a percentage of that space because it is usable for residents and does provide a useful benefit. Does it count toward the 60% lot coverage of buildings and pavement and stuff Yes, like because it is a building. Yeah, the way the, the code is currently written, it would actually penalize a uh, developer if they were to provide these additional amenities, uh, like these rec rooms, because only 6% you can count towards your open space requirements. So we feel that increasing it to 50% would result in a better product for the tenants. And these are amenities that renters want? Yes. Well, if, I think the reason it's at 6%, it means that it can basically encroach into the, or be part of the open space, but you wouldn't have like just, the building wouldn't be just that 6% number. The building would be, in other developments that have happened in the past under this zoning code, the developer would have whatever plan it is, and that building would be a little bit into the open space possibly. That's why it's so small. Otherwise, 6%, as you say, is, would be a tiny, tiny building. It wouldn't really be anything. So that's the reason it was so, so low, not because they were saying, oh, you shouldn't have it or anything like that. In a case like the example that we just talked about, if they were to have a building that was um, a rec building, it conceivably could take up most of the open, well, half of the open space, and the open space being at 16, 1,600 square feet to begin with, you're down to 800 square feet of open space and possibly not in the same area even. Well, that would be, I mean, part of what would constrain that is the 60% lot coverage because you still do need to have 40% of the lot that is not parking, not building, and not, you know, the front setback would count towards some of that, but we wouldn't get into, there's enough leverage or leeway there where it's not going to create a building or a situation where a building in the back would be allowed to count for the open space. And that's also why we're proposing it only be allowed to count for 50% of the open space, not any more than that, because we don't want a rec room to be able to account for the totality of what would be required. And uh, about that open space, there's another, I know you noticed there was an addition of the, 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 the width or the length and the, the, circum the uh, diameter or whatever of, of the open space has to be at least 10 feet. Okay, so I'm just trying to think if you had, um, couple buildings that are three stories or even two stories and I believe they have to be 15 feet a, apart if I'm not if I'm remembering reading the the text um, but whatever that distance is apart with a walkway going between those two buildings say to the parking lot into the middle area um, I'm trying to envision that as usable open space so would that be counted as usable open space? No, because the key word there just has to be usable. So, I mean, just a walkway between buildings is not usable open space. Um, so maybe if there, there's 15 feet between buildings and they put a concrete pad that has some picnic benches and a barbecue in the middle, that might be usable open space. But just the fact that it is not covered with a building, that does not make it usable open space. And that's why we kept that word in the code, usable, okay. because that gives staff a lot of leeway to look at a site plan and work with the developer to ensure that any space provided is actually usable for the residents and not just their, you know, they can't just call it open space and put it in somewhere. Staff will have the authority to say, you know what, this isn't usable. We need you to make this usable space for the residents. Okay, great. Um, the last question I have actually is about, um, I think during the study session, um, I had made a suggestion that we, we, includes whether an incentive or a requirement to have street trees on any development, and not only street trees, but trees that are against the curb with the sidewalk behind that, up against, in the public right-of-way, but have it on the developer to install those improvements if they're not already there. In some cases, they may already be there. So, um, and I noticed that it was not, I was just wondering, um, I didn't see, we don't have the minutes, or we don't have, you know, minutes of the discussion, so, um, what, what did staff think about that or what, ha 
that's not in here, so why not? It was our understanding that the majority of council wanted to go with a straight 20-foot setback and knock it into the um, application of having street trees and reducing the front setback that the straight 20-foot setback was an easier requirement for developers or anybody wishing to develop these properties. Well, and just to be clear to my fellow council members and the public and staff, this was not part of the 20-foot setback. The 20-foot setback starts at the property line and goes to the building, right? What I was talking about was in the public right-of-way, whether it's improved or not, that there would have to be some number of trees, whatever the, the number given the width of the property would be, um, and a sidewalk. And those improvements would be made by the developer if they aren't already there. I mean, in some cases, they might be there already. But they would be uh, Im improved in the public right-of-way um, and trees planted if they aren't there already as part of the project. And you will notice that in a lot of the pictures that are in the presentation, um, those pictures, for the most part, will have trees in front of the development, which makes it really a, a pleasant, uh, pleasant development. And that may be, but in parts of it, like on the, um, the North San Dimas, there's only an eight foot to 10 foot public right of way there with a sidewalk already in place. In order to create a usable parkway where we could plant trees and redo the sidewalk, we would have to have the, anybody who owns that property would have to give up land to the city at that point and redirect the sidewalk. Um, all of that would create an additional barrier to any kind of development, which is part of what we were trying to eliminate through this process. All right, thanks. So, Council Member Emmer, so, um, so I do re recall that discussion we had, and I believe also as part of that, I think you had mentioned that if they provide those, those additional street trees as an incentive, they can have a reduced setback maybe to 15 feet. I recall we had that discussion. Um, so um, towards the end of our discussion, you know, we, in an effort to, you know, get, um, get things moving and, and we're running out of time, right. we did uh, pull the council and, and kind of just did a quick count in regards to what the council was okay with and comfortable with, um, whether we had a hard a setback of 20 feet or have these flexibilities if they provided additional street trees. So it was staff's understanding that the council overall was okay with the 20 feet. However, if that's something that was an oversight, we can certainly discuss it now and um, revise it as required. Lewis, I, yeah, I think you've described it accurately. And um, you know, upon reflection, I think that the 20 foot setback is good and that the street tree should actually be a requirement. And we can, I mean, if there is no parkway there to provide street trees, what we can do and what we often do as staff is uh, force developers or anybody looking to develop those properties to put trees on the private property. So they may not be city trees in the right of way, but there will be trees in the front. And, and what I, you know, what I've been just sharing and uh, what we've seen, um, what I've seen also is that in the case you mentioned, say the setback's eight feet, the, the right of way is eight feet um, and there's a sidewalk there. Um, what would happen is there would be a cutout for the tree. It's usually like five feet by five feet, something like that. And the sidewalk would go onto the property by a couple feet, but the setback is still 20 feet from the property line. So I, I was not suggesting that the setback would go, would start at the edge of the sidewalk. Uh, I was suggesting that there be a sidewalk there and that there be trees up against the curb to provide that kind of canopy that uh, I think is attractive. But that's, it. but yeah, but you were right, Lewis, about the, how, how you characterized it. Thanks. That's all I have for right now. All right, any, any further questions? I had two quick questions. The first question I had, uh, thank you very much for incorporating these changes uh, from the feedback that you received during our study session. The first question I had was, um, I can't remember if I asked this during our study session or not, but in other cities, what percentage do they typically count rec areas and other things? Is it 50% or was that a number that we came up with on our own? Is that generally seen as a standard? Um, I know the 6% was not really a, a standard at all, but I'm just curious as to how that 50% number came to be and then what other cities use that as a basis for counting it as open space? It's a number to kind of be because we thought it was reasonable. There are other cities that use it. There are other cities that don't let you count it at all. Um, although that is, of the cities we polled, that is not common. Um, there is no city that lets you count it for 100%. Uh, well, we thought it was a good compromise 
of providing the amenities that an apartment complex or development needs while still providing a good amount of open space on a property. Okay, so essentially it was uh, more based on internal discussions rather than looking at standards as other cities, it sounds like, is that correct? It was based on a combination of the two. It was based on looking at what other cities do and looking at what we thought was right for developments within San Dimas. The second question I had is related to the chart that is up there. You had mentioned during the city session that some cities were in discussions to reduce the open space requirements even more. Has that happened since the chart was, the numbers were pulled, or have we seen any additional changes of movement no. or discussions that may result in an updated chart that gives us a better idea of where cities are moving in terms of their open space? No, we don't. We are one of the first cities moving forward with this, um, but we, we know there are other cities where it's in their housing element to address it. Uh, what None of those cities have taken it forward yet. They still have a year before they have to move forward with these amendments. So our housing element was actually certified October of last year, and it was certified ahead of many other cities. Um, so that's why um, we weren't able to find examples of whatever the cities have done in response to their housing elements. But um, it's from our understanding and the research we've done that uh, most of the cities have had these also requirements in, in place. Some actually, I think, well, I think for us, it was very specific. Um, they, were, they gave a specific direction to amend parking, open space, and setbacks, while other cities, um, they just told them to look at development standards in general. But typically, these standards are the ones that affect development. So, Laverne was tasked in their housing element with meeting with three developers of affordable units, uh, getting recommendations from them and moving forward with those recommendations. So our, our commitments were set in the housing element, while cities like Laverne were going to be set through discussions with developers. Got it. Okay. If I may, I have one more question. So I know that you had worked closely with the Planning Commission on some of their feedback on this. And out of curiosity, since I didn't attend that particular meeting, um, would you be able to uh, identify or summarize some of the main points of discussion, concern, or input that they had regarding the um, development of these standards? Was there anything that was a point of interest or um, concern in their, in their inf input and discussions with you? Well, at the original meeting where this was um, introduced, the Planning Commission is the one that tasked us with reducing street side and side setbacks. Our only initi when we initiated this, we were only looking at open space. Uh, the Planning Commission suggested we reduce the front and side setbacks. At the last Planning Commission meeting, when, this, when they recommended approval, since this had already been through the City Council study session, uh, they had very few comments on the proposal now. Thank you. Those are my questions. Any additional questions? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for putting the work into this that you guys have. Uh, I think it balances uh, a lot of uh, different things and it does it well. Um, it's not ideal. I, I, I do believe that when we talk about reducing setbacks and, and uh, uh, things of this nature, it, it kind of leaves people thinking of stack and pack type of developments and uh, you know as far as what we can do I think we've we've balanced uh, this well with this um, uh, new municipal code text so thank you for the work that you put into it uh, my question to you would only be uh, the one thing that matters to me and that's that uh, you believe that Obviously, this would satisfy our requirements that uh, that are set forth in our housing element as to you know what we need to do for our due diligence uh, to meet their requirements, right? We we believe they do. Um, we believe we, we believe we're doing enough to remove the constraint, but at the same time, like you said, still kind of protect the character and development of the city of San Dimas. So we feel that we've done enough. Um, we, as part of the housing element, uh, we are required to report to them on an annual basis in in um, in April. And that's when we give them the update as to what we've done. Um, so we feel that what we're doing today is responsible development and it's getting ahead of it as opposed to waiting for the state to come back and tell us to reduce it to a number that's significantly lower. I, I definitely appreciate that. And uh, again, thank you for your work. Um, I, I think uh, uh, my goal with this whole process was to not give away the whole farm and I don't think we have. So I appreciate it. Thank you. 
I'll jump on the bandwagon and say thank you for all your, your work in this. I think that the discussions around this were complex, and uh, I think there was a lot of um, push and pull to be able to make sure that we struck the right balance to maintain uh, the goals that we have here while still moving forward with other initiatives to comply with. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I would uh, move to introduce Ordinance 1301 as uh, recommended by staff. Prior to that, can I make some statements? Yeah. Thank you. First one is just a housekeeping, just a little piece of housekeeping. I think we have on all the monitors these uh, graphs. Is that true? I can't tell. Out there. No, the back has you. I can, I can see you over here. Okay. Um, what I'd like in the future is, uh, Ken, you're, you're doing the talking. I hear this voice coming because I can't see it. I hear Lewis. And uh, I would think the public should have an opportunity to know who's speaking when, when that's going on. Obviously, out there, uh, here, we know Lewis is our planning director. Okay, um, I'm not sure the community knows that, you know, that chime in and that you're giving us good information uh, is, is coming from somebody who has some knowledge of this. We know that we're talking, but it'd be nice if, this, if the community could know uh, which, who you represent and what you're representing. So I, if maybe when we introduce one person, then maybe we should introduce the second person to have an opportunity for that person to know it. Now, I think we all know one of the major problems around here. Thank you very much for everything you've done on this. I know it's been a lot of hard work, but I think we all know as we sit up here, one of the major problems in San Dimas is going to be parking. It's always parking. Whenever we talked about Pioneer Square, what did we resort to? Back to the parking issues. And then you, you mentioned and talked about AB 2097, about the parking. And then you make, right before you say that we have no alternatives, you do make a comment about the passage of 2097 as one of the many recent legislative that de <clears throat> legislations that demonstrates the state's aggressive actions to further multifamily development. Okay, therefore, it is imperative that the city move forward with the parking and other development standard amendments now and not, not wait for the state to provide that direction, which would likely be far less restrictive than the standards that the staff is currently pr present. I'm glad you observed that, but could you just go in to talk about the parking standards a little more than you did? Um, that would be on page 116 through uh, 117. D discuss what you're foreseeing in, in a little greater detail. Absolutely. Um, so this is the graph that has the parking for San Dimas and cities around us. So currently in San Dimas, for any studio or one bedroom, we, prov we require two spaces. For a two bedroom unit, we require two spaces. Uh, for anything above two bedrooms, we require two spaces plus one bedroom per unit, which would mean three bedroom, three spaces, four bedroom, four spaces. Um, I'll get into guest parking in a minute, but what essentially that means is even if you're a single person living in an apartment, your apartment has two spaces. If you are a family living in a three bedroom with two children, your parking space ha or your unit has three spaces, even though you have two kids that are four and six and shouldn't be driving at this point. Um, what we are doing is, in San Dimas currently, is looking for the worst case scenario. So we're saying, okay, well, maybe that three bedroom is gonna have two parents who both have a car plus a 16 year old who has a car. Uh, what we believe our current standards are, or what our proposed standards are doing is realizing that not everything is worst case scenario. That you are going to have a single individual living in a one bedroom or a studio, where you are going to have you know, a family with two little kids living in a three bedroom. They don't all need cars. Um, at the same time, when we're allowing for 1.5 units per studio or one bedroom, we are allowing that, you know, you are going to have one bedrooms that have a couple living in them where they both have cars. The 1.5 spaces per unit allows for both. You can have a unit that has one bedroom, or um, I'm sorry, one driver, a unit that has two drivers. We have parking for both at that point. Um, so we believe what we're doing is a realistic parking capacity within 
what the state wants us to do. And we feel that it is in the best interest of San Dimas to par pass something like this before the state says, you know what, you get one parking space per spot, period. We're trying to stay on top of what we believe may be coming from the state. Um, for guest parking, uh, we are going from one, point, one for every three units to one for every four. Um, well, this would have an effect if we were talking about developments that have 200 units. Uh, let me go to the map. This is a map of the existing multifamily spaces within San Dimas. Nearly all of these are already developed. The only one that isn't developed as of this time is this single corner, which is at San Dimas and Allen. Uh, that corner, if it were fully developed, could only handle 30, maybe 34 units. Um, when we talk about going from one for every three unit, one parking space for every three units to one parking space for every four units, and we're talking about a loss of maybe three parking spaces. Um, we don't see anything that we are doing is none of the proposals should have a dramatic impact on any development or you know, cause all this under to be a rush on street parking. We're trying to take the standards that San Dimas has, which are a little high, even in comparison to other cities, and just make them realistic for most families. Thank you. Any, any further questions? No, but I, uh, I, you were about to make a motion. I don't mind making comments before or after your motion. I'll withdraw the motion. Yeah, I'd like to ask my fellow council members for a couple changes uh, to give to staff, or I'd like to, uh, to at least think about it. Um, San Dimas has always prided itself on being a low-density city. And as I've said before, the state has requirements, mandates, things we got to do, ramming down our throats. And that's, you know, we may not like it, but we have to go along with it. But the paragraph that Emmett just read about um, trying to get ahead of the game, in fact, it's almost like, you know, trying to get twice as far as the state wants us to go. I, I don't agree with us trying to guess what further draconian measures the state is going to impose on us. So, for example, let's stick with the parking, for example. The, the, the fact of the matter is that if you've got a three-bedroom unit, uh, you're probably going to have two cars for those three-bedroom, the occupants of that three-bedroom unit. And even if you don't, you've got a, you've got a couple two-bedroom units with the 1.5, and uh, one bedroom or studio, whatever, and they all have the 1.5 um, requirement. There's, there's nothing wrong in my mind with that, but think about it. That's a reduction from two for the studio, one bedroom or two, unit, two bedrooms, from two parking spots to 1.5. So we're making strides, we're reducing it by 25%. And I think the state's gonna look at that and say, hey, good job as opposed to you didn't go far enough. We're reducing the parking from, for three be, from, from three bedrooms, for three, three bedrooms, from what is now three parking spots. And I would say that we should, if it's a three bedroom unit, we should require two parking spots, two full parking spots. I can support that. And still we would be reducing the parking. Um, well, we council member, we are suggesting two parking spots for every, three bedroom or more unit, and we are actually suggesting two parking spots with no change for, the two, for two bedroom units. The only changes would be to eliminate the extra parking spot per bedroom for three bedroom or more units, and to go from two unit or two spots to 1.5 for studio and one bedroom. You know, I read that darn thing through and through, and I missed that. So, so it's two bedrooms, two parking spots for a three bedroom. Two yes. yes, and it is two parking spots for a two-bedroom. We are proposing absolutely no change to that requirement. All right, I'm going to take your word for it and look at it later on. But okay, that's great. That's, that's why I can support it. I'll strike that one off my list, so nobody has to think about that or anything because uh, we're in agreement. I was trying to figure out which were, were, what you were you were thinking because I thought I read. Yeah, you know, my mistake. I will, I will definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. say my mistake. Okay. Um, that's not possible. The, we are, so, so anyway, we're doing a good job at reducing parking, in my opinion, by what we're doing, and I support it. We're doing a good job at the front setback by reducing it from 25 to 20 feet. 
And I support that. And that's, that's great. And I think, again, the state's going to say this is, this is, they want us to reduce setbacks. We're reducing the side setback uh, if it joins the street from, I think, 20 to 15. So we're reducing setbacks all over the place, exactly what the state says. So we're doing enough there. When it comes to the open space, that's where I have a problem. Because right now, we talk about 30% of the total lot coverage. So let's reduce it. Let's reduce it by a third to 20%, which equals, in, your, in an example of a 10,000 square foot lot, for example, you would be going from 3,000 square, square feet of uh, open space to 2,000 if you did 500 per unit, in the example we were talking about up there on, on San Dimas Avenue. So I could support this if we went with the change of going to 500 square feet of usable open space per unit. And I'm, I'm asking my fellow council members if that might not be a little bit less of a draconian change. Um, the other thing is the 10 foot radius or dimension of the open space, I believe should be increased to 15 feet. I mean, I was sitting uh, in, in my uh, house today and 10 feet in each direction, I, it was just you know a very small area to be considered this is common area, you know. I could see if it was adjoining other parts of the co common area, and it was like a little finger or something like that, but 10 feet by 10 feet surrounded by whatever it is, building stairs, uh, what, parking lot, whatever, it just seemed too small. So I would ask to increase that to 15 feet, and all of that, in my opinion, is still a big change to how to our policies of the past, which was always to provide as much open space as possible to make these units and people livable for the people living there and for the neighbors and, and uh, surrounding people. So that's the two changes I would suggest, 500 square feet per unit and 15 feet as opposed, it's uh, not on that chart, but the 15 feet is the, uh, what you added as far as a minimum dimension in all directions for the open space. For staff, I guess, you know, it's the season of giving and I'm feeling really generous. I might have to agree with John. So is there any significant issue you see with uh, what this is proposed? My only concern, I don't see an issue with the 15 feet. That's fine. My only concern is that if we go to five, we go to 500 square feet per unit, Claremont right now is at 400 square feet per unit. And my understanding is that they were directed to reduce that. So if we go to 500, I believe that we're still going to be on the on HCD's radar. That would be my only concern. It would still put us among the highest. Um, we would be requiring among the highest amount of open space for any city surrounding us. Can, can I ask, was there anything that drove the decision to go from a percentage to uh, a square foot uh, allotment for the open space? Mainly that it gives developers a tangible number that they can look at and say, this is what we're looking to develop. This is what we have to provide. Um, and that's more of the standard that you see across cities as well. Yeah, yeah you, in the comparisons, it definitely look like yeah, most yeah. cities. If you look at any of the other cities up here, um, if I can find the right slide, uh, we're the only one really, except for Monrovia, requiring a percentage um, and Laverne. But like I said, Laverne has been tasked with changing that number. Um, the open space requirement is a square foot. Makes it much more of a sure thing for developers where they can look at something and go, okay, this is what I have to provide, whereas the percentage is a lot more up in the air. Um, so that's, we were, we were just trying to kind of align ourselves with the common thinking as far as planning goes. Okay. Thanks. Claremont was 400 square feet per bedroom, not per unit. So this is per unit I'm talking about. Well, and the other cities that have been tasked, I know on there with looking at reducing their open space requirements are Glendora, Monrovia, and La Habra. And like we have already stated, Laverne. Well, I will say I am supportive of your suggestions, John. Thank you, Ryan. I, I will, I'm going to stick to that. It's only two changes. Otherwise, I support the whole thing. So just for clarification, John, uh, we kind of talked about going from 30% open space to 20, and then uh, the number of 500 square foot per unit got thrown out there too, which... Uh, oh, I'm, I'm talking about the 500 per, per unit. So. Okay. Gotcha. I was saying that in an example that I think, uh, I 
think Ken referred to an example of a 10,000 square foot lot. That would work out to 5%. It would work out to 20%, and I'm, I'm just saying that's any, on the lower any end. Any possibility that if we go to the 500, that they would revert back to the 400? There's, I mean, they wouldn't revert back, but they may task us. They may, when they review our housing element, the progress report we submit every year, they may say that, you know what, we don't consider this program as being met. You need to revisit this program. Well, we have just, open, again, open space reduced by a third. Side setback along the street reduced by 25%. Front set setback reduced by 20%. So I, I feel that we are making enormous strides, and the parking, you know, again, reduced by so much. So I, I feel we're making enormous strides toward densifying. And when I think about lots like the one up there on San Dimas Avenue going to possibly three stories, because let's be, let's be real about this, what a lot of people do, they get the entitlements, and we've got places in town that have entitlements. They had nice plans in front of us, and they never built it. And then they sold the property at a profit because they got the entitlements. So we're not, the people that submitted the MCTA aren't the, one, the people who necessarily will build the project and what you've seen. It could be sold and somebody could easily come in and say, I want three stories on that lot, I want four units, I'm gonna have three bedrooms and all this kind of stuff. And all of this, so we need to protect ourselves as much as possible. That's what I'm saying. I'm gonna figuratively strap myself to that tree with you. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. I've I've I've, I've kind of uh, taken the temperature by watching head snod and and uh, things like that. So, if anyone would like to make a motion, I'd, I'd be entertaining it. I'll make a motion that we um, adopt um, or we introduce Municipal Code Text Amendment twenty two dash zero 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 three, as proposed by staff, with two changes, and that's that the open space requirement be. 500 square feet per unit as opposed to 400 square feet per unit, and that the minimum dimension of any open space component be increased from 10 feet, as is in the uh, proposed text amendment, to 15 feet. Second. Uh, any further questions? I had two. Uh, first is, is just for clarification, this really only impacts that one property that you had pointed out on the map earlier. Is there... I mean, it impacts any property that is zoned multifamily, oh, right. which there are multiple right, right now. The, zone, real, the only real, one that simply. isn't developed, which would be able to take full it advantage is. of this, would be this area up here. That's the only one that's not developed with the multifamily property. The others would basically have to redevelop the properties to take advantage of these standards. You had also mentioned that um, increasing the amount of open space and other things begins to make projects economically unfeasible. Do you believe that these changes would push that into the unfeasible bucket? It, it's hard to say, and, and obviously, um, a lot of times when you're making land, you're looking at land use decisions, you can try and, and leave that when you're factoring in which way to go. But I think one of the main things that was making these other projects infeasible, specifically the one that triggered this, was the parking. That, that providing that they're requiring that additional uh, parking space for any a unit with two bedrooms or more. Um, I think that was one of the major things that was making that, that particular development unable to move forward. So in terms of the open space, um, it probably wouldn't affect it as much as parking. I'm sure it also have some impact, but I think parking is the biggest one I think that, that the applicants were concerned with. So I'll just make a quick comment. Um, John, I hear you, and um, the only concern I really have with this is that the more open space you provide comes at the expense of the amount of space that a unit has. And when you think about the types of families that are trying to get their first homes, um, the ones that used to be able to buy the larger track homes in St. Emus, and because of the housing prices, it's just it's out of reach. They're a million dollars now for a regular track home. So this is kind of their shot now at being able to live in St. Amos. Teachers, police officers, firefighters. And when they're trying to raise families, you need space within their unit. And having a nice green space outside, well, nice to look at, makes it harder for their families when they lack that space within a unit. 
So that's really the trade-off. If there was no trade-off, I would have no problem supporting yours. But when you think about especially someone who is raising kids and they're going to be teenagers, that, that extra 100 feet in a unit really could help make a difference. So that's, that's the dilemma that I have with your proposal. I hear what you're saying. Um, these units will not be inexpensive. So um, it, now the state's rationale, and a lot of politicians, is that if you just build a zillion units, then the price will come down. So the, the argument you make might be true in the grand scheme of thing, that these four units would add to millions of other units, and then the price would come down for all of them because there's a glut. Right. But these units are market rate. The developer wants to do three bedrooms, which, if you're talking about a family, maybe three bedrooms is, is a good, is, would, be, would work for them. The other side of it is that those kids, if they're, if they're ki any kids or adults, older people, whatever, need a little bit of open space within, with, within easy access. And so it's not just something to look at, although that's pleasant as well, of course, but it's something to actually use and sit out in, in the sun or the shade and plant a couple trees there or you know, have the tot lot and be able to um, not just squeeze these amenities in, but actually have them usable. So the philosophy is that people, and you know, it, as you know, I live in a craftsman house, and the philosophy back then was try to integrate outdoors and indoors so that it flows a little bit. Our house used to have a, I don't know if you know our house, but the front has been enclosed, but it used to be just a big porch, like a sleeping porch with a big roof on it. It was huge. And people would just kind of hang out there in the open air or sleep there, as a matter of fact, in those days. So, but the idea is this, it's that same idea, and I think San Dimas has done a good job over the years at trying to keep that, let's have the outdoors be a part of our, our mental well-being, really, and not be cooped up in the house all the time. So, uh, so that's why it should be usable and not just something to pass by on your way to your, to your unit. In addition to that, we are going to have so many units. The capacity in the downtown specific plan is for over 3,000 units, the capacity for de developers to come in and build apartments that have very little open space. So when, we're, when we have the opportunity to retain this lower density, I think we should try to take it. And as I said before, we're reducing things so much compared to the way it, things were developed in the 70s and 80s in the developments that you're, we were talking about that are already there, um, I think it gives these, the property owner and an investor uh, a good opportunity to get a return on their investment and for the families to have a place to, place to be. That's mine. Okay. But I can understand both sides of it. So, you know, I... That's, that's I mean, from my vantage point, growing up uh, a family of six in a, a house where we had a large backyard, I think you had mentioned you enclosed your porch... We needed that space. It was really, really tough at times when all of us were crammed mm. inside and, you know, on top of each other. And you could so swap that's... stories about growing up in <laughs> houses with a lot of kids. Yeah. So, uh, I and I know had, everyone has a different experience. I think but we that's... had uh, about 10 kids in the family when we moved to a bigger house. We were living in a, a uh, four small bedroom house. Not many families are as big as yours, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will say, though, to the point of that discussion that, you know, my condo, I mean, I grew up in the north part of town. It's a large property, equestrian property. And then when I bought the condo down, which is essentially transit-oriented development, there's no yard there. There's a shared pocket park uh, for the community. But it makes you appreciate all of the other homes that we have here. And to John's point with the downtown specific plan, eventually there will be density in downtown. And even on a single single person income, when I purchased that uh, condo at 341, I mean, it's doubled with equity at this point. And I suspect our future developments, intro condos, townhomes, will do the same for people. 
And that equity hopefully will translate into one of these beautiful open space homes that we're doing right now in another area of town. Um, the, I agree with you that the starter home is hard for people here. And uh, anybody I've talked to in my profession at work, they just say, hey, you know, San Dimas is a uh, dual income, no kids type of town, you know, until you get here, you know, and then you figure it out. But it, it is challenging. I don't disagree with that, but, but it's not impossible. And I think that's the thing that, you know, we are working towards building the affordable housing. Um, but I also think that so many people, when they finally get to their single family home, you know, a lot of things people talk about here is just the open space, the good school district, the trees, you know, not over the top trees, but the trees and, you know, stuff like that. So I, I, that's why I'm supportive of this. I think that, you know, hopefully we continue to support those types of developments. Frankly, as many of you know, I'd like to see more SF 20,000 square feet properties with equestrian use is really what I'd prefer to see. Um, but when you talk about feasibility and who will develop it, you know, we've heard that time and time again that there's just not developers interested in on the ROI, which is unfortunate because people are paying a lot of money to board their horses elsewhere, you know. But. All right. Any further? No. All right, I'll bring it back. There's a motion on the floor to introduce Ordinance 1301, motion by uh, Councilman Ebner, seconded by Councilman, uh, uh, what's your name? Ryan Vienna. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor, no. We, <clears throat> Mayor, we, need to, we do need to have a reading of the title of the ordinance. Okay. Last right. Ordinance 1301. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Dimas, County of Los Angeles, California. Approving Municipal Code Text Amendment 22-0003. An amendment to Chapter 18.42, Multiple Family Zone of the San Dimas Municipal Code to reduce the required amount of open green areas, open space, and front and side yard setbacks. And Chapter 18.156, Vehicle Parking and Storage of the San Dimas Municipal Code to reduce the required amount of parking for multifamily developments along with various cleanup items. We have a motion to waive for the reading? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Motion carries 4-1 with Councilman um, Nakano voting no. We'll move on to uh, oral communications. Members of the audience, speakers are limited to three minutes or as may be determined by the chair. Anyone, anyone wishing to speak to the council at this time? Seeing none, we'll move on to city manager's report. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, no report from me, but I'm gonna ask the city clerk to give an update on the election. This is uh, just a reminder that we are still in the nomination period, period for our no, uh, November, March 5th, 2024 election. Uh, there are um, two districts that the public will be voting on, District 1 and District 3, along with the mayor. There have been one, two, three, four potential candidates who have pulled papers and two who have filed papers and qualified as of 530 today. Uh, there, is, there are additional, in, there is additional information on the city's website along with the latest bulletin that was published and posted today and that would be election bulletin number five. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, city attorney. I have no reports tonight, Mayor. Members of the City Council, Council members reports on meetings attended at the uh, expense of the local agency pursuant to AB 1234. Seeing none, Councilman Nakano. Uh, sorry, is this open 
uh, forum or is this the reporting of meetings? No, open forum. Got it. Thank you. Uh, just three quick things, Mr. Mayor. I want to. Um, I, I want to first um, thank staff for all the planning that they are in process of doing for this weekend's extravaganza. I know, as always, it'll be an, a fantastic event. I look forward to being there and to seeing everybody there. I know it's a big draw for a number of residents, both here in St. Emus and elsewhere, uh, and I know it'll be a success. So can't wait to see all of you this, uh, this December 2nd on Saturday uh, when the festiv festivities kick off uh, in the evening. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is um, Merry Christmas to everybody. I know that we have one meeting left, but it's never too early to get into the Christmas spirit. So I wanted to start wishing people now happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever your background or faith may be. Uh, and uh, look forward to a festive December as we move into the new year. And lastly, I want to say, um, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. I certainly did. It's good to be back in business. Uh, I want to thank again city staff for monitoring things over the course of uh, the holiday and ensuring that things were running smoothly uh, and really appreciate all the hard work uh, staff had done, uh, especially as we discuss some of the matters today in our agenda packet. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Weber. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I honestly hope, and I had a chance to, that everybody uh, was able to gather with family and friends and reflect on really everything that we have to be thankful for here, um, especially in light of everything that's going on, the current state of affairs in many countries around the world right now. Uh, it makes you really grateful to look at what we do have and the problems that we don't have and, uh, and make you very grateful for everything that we, we have here in our nation and our beautiful city of San Dimas, including our open space. Uh, but that is it. Councilman Abner. Okay, yeah, a couple of things. Um, Senator Rubio earlier talked about the San Gabriel Valley Regional Housing Trust, and um, I, I won't go into what that is, but it, uh, but it, I believe you can get money from there, but I think you need to be a member of the Regional Housing Trust, which actually would be a budget item, because I don't know if we are a member right now. But I was wondering if there was another council member who would support asking staff to look into what it would take, like A, are we a member of the Regional Housing Trust right now? And B, what would it take to become a member if we aren't? I have no problem with that. Okay, so that was, thank you on that. And uh, second, um, you know, we uh, are entering the rainy season. We're hoping it's gonna be um, a, more rain than um, typical, maybe not quite as much as last year, and we'll be lucky if it is. But in general, um, water is something that we are, um, we should be concerned about here in California. And interestingly enough, um, if you probably know this already, but it doesn't, it bears repeating that one of the things that actually helps conserve and even create more rain are, wait for it, trees. So um, th there have been a lot of studies and planting more trees and especially where they're dense, but any number of trees that you plant creates minor percentage increases in the amount of rainfall that falls later on. So that's one importance of trees. And also, you know, trees uh, make the soil, I'm, I'm reading from a little thing I got from the Arbor Day Foundation, so I'm a member of that. But uh, trees make the soil around them absorb water like a sponge, as they say. So it can be released slowly over time. Um, they also hold the soil in place, preventing erosion and stopping mud and silt from running into our water supplies and down the drain and into the, uh, into the um, storm drains and everything. So um, yet another reason to support the planting of trees. And um, I'll leave it at that. And thank you uh, very much. We'll thank see you on Saturday. Thank you. Right. Or, be, or before. But, Councilman uh, Vienna. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. A um, few things. Um, one is, funny enough, I thought about you not too long ago because well, you once said that um, trees greatly assisted public safety and combated crime. And I actually 
watched a chase the other day where someone slammed into a tree, and I thought to myself, John was right. There you that go. tree actually helped stop, stop crime. So I, that was good. That was, that was good. I, I did think about you in that moment. That was pretty funny. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. One is um, thank you, uh, Mr. Fickleman, for reminding me of the USC-UCLA score a few minutes ago. That was very depressing. Congratulations to the Bruins and uh, all of you out there who are uh, Bruins fans. Uh, well earned. Uh, hopefully the defense will figure itself out for SC for next year, but uh, nevertheless, uh, enjoy the bill temporarily. Um, that being said, uh, since our last meeting, I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, um, got to spend time uh, with their families or their friends or their loved ones. Um, during this time, and, and as I usually say, you know, uh, mental health uh, is a priority for a lot of people, so please make sure um, you know, if you need resources, 988 is a good resource out there to be able to get assistance uh, if you find yourself struggling with some mental health uh, challenges during this time. Um, to that end, uh, on the third uh, coming up on Sunday, um, Toys for Tots, a Toys for Tots collection uh, is going to be taking place um, at Sharky's uh, Swim and Scuba that's over off of Arrow here in town. So, that's a local veteran-owned business. Um, they've donated a lot of stuff to the uh, Marine Corps Foundation Toys for Tots program in the past, uh, and they're going to do so again. So uh, if you would like, uh, go down there and donate uh, some toys or whatever you can. That would be very helpful to help some families in need. Uh, I have to say, if you donate more than $5,000, because I'm making this announcement, there is a behest type of thing I have to be aware of. So please contact me so I can properly report this um, as I have to if, in fact, you do donate quite a substantial amount of toys just to make sure I'm doing all my FPPC stuff. Um, and to that end, um, also, uh, I wanted to shout out to the Sheriff's Department. Um, well, two things. I'll do the positive one first. Uh, the toy drive uh, coming up at Target uh, on the 9th. Um, you know, that's going to be at 10 o'clock over in the Target parking lot. Last year, it was really great. Uh, the Mounted Posse, everybody was out there, um, and they always do a really good job of collecting toys uh, and getting them to families in need. Um, so please, if you have some time, stop by and, and help out there. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, I know the community was out here today. Uh, I know the Sheriff's Department responded. Um, you know, to the situation related to the squatters and, you know, to the community, you are heard. Um, I received several phone calls uh, about this. Uh, I too am concerned. I spoke with uh, Captain Ashrafnia before the council meeting. Uh, I know everything's being done that can be done to expeditiously resolve this particular matter. Um, to that end, I hope that people really, uh, truly report things when you see them happening. Don't wait uh, in situations as it relates to squatting or trespassing, um, whether it could be somebody doing utility theft and taking all the copper out of somebody's walls, uh, or it really could be a burglary in progress. We just don't know, but sometimes waiting to report can only complicate things. Um, and so it is important that you please report things in a very timely manner uh, so that the sheriff's department deputies can respond and they can swiftly investigate uh, and do whatever they need to do. Uh, that being said, my last thing is, you know, I just, uh, one, Chris, I hope you feel better, uh, you know, and, and whatever else you got going on. Um, you know, over the last week, uh, I, I got uh, sick last week. Uh, it was kind of miserable, uh, and it was a respiratory infection that I had appeared, apparently got from a buddy of mine. Um, there is something going around. I don't really know what it is, but... Uh, it mimics a common cold, but it really is uh, an infection. So I would highly encourage everyone to please go to the doctor if you find yourself, uh, you know, scratchy throat turning into some sort of crazy coughing thing that turns into what feels like a cold, but a super spiced up cold. Um, you know, thankfully on, on my part of it, uh, I happen to know who I got it from uh, on a Friday and by Monday. Um, you know, I was starting to be symptomatic, uh, subsequently ended up with antibiotics, a Z-Pak and, um, some cough medicine and most of it resolved within 72 hours or so. So, um, please, please, please take care of yourselves. Weather's changing. It's cold. 
and um, you know, people do get ill during this time and we're all gonna be around loved ones and all that and nobody wants to be sick during the holidays. So with that last thing, thank you staff, all of you um, from everyone. Uh, you guys always make sure we're doing great. And uh, Thanksgiving is one of those times just to say thank you. And I hope all of you had a great uh, holiday season as well. And thank you for all your work um, throughout the year. And uh, hopefully we'll bring this thing to an end here uh, very shortly. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. It's going to be a while. Before I make some comments, I'd like to uh, ask Scott Wasserman to come up to the podium and probably give us a brief rundown of what's going to occur at the extravaganza. I would have thought maybe we might have heard something about that a little earlier, but quite honestly, I think there are people out there wanting to know what time the parade's starting, what time lights are going out, all the good things that you guys have been working very hard on. Great, there it goes. Uh, the, uh, the parade actually, everything begins at three o'clock. The parade begins at three o'clock out on Bonita Avenue. And uh, we also have um, stories with Mrs. Mrs. Claus at the Walker House and also crafts with Mrs. Claus at the Walker House. Five o'clock is really when all of the evening show kind of starts. That's after, right after the parade, uh, gets dark out. Six o'clock is the actual tree lighting. And if you've joined us before uh, for previous holiday extravaganzas, this will look a little bit similar, but we try to change it up each year to keep it, keep it kind of fresh. So we think that you'll really enjoy it this year. Good. We're, we're, everybody's looking forward to it. I was up and down the uh, downtown the last three or four days several times, and I know the businesses are, are thinking very positive about it, and they're looking forward to it. So. Thank you, staff. I'm, I, it's hard to beat last year, the year before, and the year before, but you guys do a fabulous job of doing it, so, so thank you very much. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to swing for the fences again this year. Good. Yeah. good. There's no doubt you, you probably go over it. Yes. <laughs> Is my horse ready to go? I, no, everybody's going to ride in cars. <laughs> I looked thank at you. your horse the other day. <laughs> You know, I, I too want to wish, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Obviously, we all know that the universal language for Thanksgiving is food. It doesn't matter what household it is. Everybody enjoys themselves a food. I can tell you, my family prepared two turkeys. I looked at it and said, who the heck's going to eat all this food? And quite honestly, I go to the refrigerator, start looking in there, and this food's gone. I got I get kids that come over <laughs> And they take what they want, and if you try to make a turkey sandwich three days later, you, you ain't going to find it. But uh, I think we all know and we all enjoy, and I'm glad that everybody's uh, looking forward to it. And as we know, Christmas is coming, and all the holidays and everything that's going on, is, uh, as one of the, my fellow councilmen said, there's a lot going on in this world, and we're all, you know, I think people all over the world are suffering, and that uh, we, as a, as a nation, as a community, uh, need to realize and, and say those extra prayers and that something settles down somewhere. There's a lot of places out there hurting and that uh, we're fortunate here in, the, in this, this community. Um, I guess the best thing we can say is don't be shy. Come out to the parade. Let's see the roads both sides of the roads completely filled. And then uh, six o'clock is going to be that tree lighting. And uh, I will say, I understand that uh, the Christmas tree this year is extraordinary. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing it from the staff. I'm hearing from the people who've been looking and cheating and looking. So uh, let's, let's have fun and, and let's make sure that uh, we all have a safe and and a happy December, all of December, okay? Thank you. We're going to, there's something really unique about tonight. There is no closed session. <laughs> so we're going to call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>